and welcome to this episode of Skiff Meetings Podcast. My name is Andrea Doyle, and I am the executive editor at Skiff Meetings. In this episode titled Uncovering the Untold Story, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kitty Radcliffe, the president of Explore St. Louis. One of the keys to Kitty's success, doing just that, uncovering the untold story. She does it by leaving her office and interacting with the 115 full-timers who report to her, as well as the hundreds of part-timers. That is how she gets the untold stories. That might not be so positive, but they are the stories she feels she needs to hear. We cover things like how receiving MPI's Industry Leader Award in June brought her 40-year involvement with the organization Full Circle. We chatted about what it has been like to be a vegetarian for the past 40 years and how the issue of travel boycotts is not new and what it was like when the Equal Rights Amendment was being fought to guarantee the protection against sexual discrimination for women. She talked about how women have broken the glass ceiling, but there's still progress that needs to be made and how hard work got her to where she is today. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and I invite you to check out other episodes from today's most influential event professionals. You can find all the episodes on our website or subscribe through your favorite podcast service. Now for a word from our sponsors, PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. I'm Kitty Radcliffe, president of Explore St. Louis. And um, congratulations on the award you received during MPI WEC. Thank you. It was a big honor for me. Actually, like, overwhel- actually overwhelming to receive it. So. And it's such a beautiful evening. Uh, it was uh, it was extraordinary. M- MPI just did an amazing job with that event, um, uh, working with the Hilton Tulum in Mexico and Riviera Maya. And um, the, you walked into the ballroom and you thought you were in the jungle. It was just beautifully decorated. So it, it, it just set the stage for a really wonderful evening. Right. And you received MPI's 2023 Industry Leader Award. That's correct. Yeah. Wow. And what does that recognition mean to you? Well, it's um, uh, it was astonishing to me, actually. Um, I mean, I've been involved with MPI since since I got in the business, and that's forty years ago. I joined. <laughs> actually, it was really it was really interesting because I joined MPI forty years ago because MPI's annual conference was being held in St. Louis, oh, wow. and I could attend. And they gave me the industry leader award exactly 40 years later. Um, so from nothing, from being nothing and no a nobody at the um, you know, at the start of the business and kind of learning my way through to being recognized for having made some contribution at some level for MPI uh, all that time later was was really very wonderful. Talk about full circle. It really was full circle. (laughs) And um, when you went to your first MPI in St. Louis, what were you doing at that time 40 years ago? I had just started in the industry about um, seven or eight months earlier. Um, I was hired to be the first director for a startup, very small convention and tourism bureau in Carbondale, Illinois, which is a a university town about 100 miles southeast of St. Louis in southern Illinois. And um, so when I when I went in for the interview, uh, you know, nobody who had any experience doing that kind of job was going to move to Carbondale to do it. Um, So they had a they had a bunch of inexperienced 
candidates that they were interviewing. And so I did my research in the library. And one of the things that I said when I went into the interview, and they said to me, well, what would you do if you got the job? And I said, well, I would join this organization and this organization and this, and I would do this and this. And one of those things was I would join meeting planners because that's what it was called at the time, meeting planners international. And I would get people to bring their meetings and conferences to Carbondale and they didn't laugh at me. So, and they hired me. So it was, it was, it was very interesting. So that was your start. Yeah. And so that I just, I was just got lucky that in fact, the conference itself was being, um, held in St. Louis that that next year. Um, if it were being held anywhere else, I probably would not have attended. But because it was 100 miles up the road, I could drive. I didn't have to buy an airplane ticket. Um, and, uh, and St. Louis is a very affordable destination. So I was able to afford the hotel room for a couple of nights in my very tiny budget and um, walked into the opening night reception and didn't know a soul. And a guy who worked for Merits came up to me and saw my first timer badge and introduced himself and said I should join the chapter and get involved with the chapter. And so I did. What a great story. Yeah. That chapter was a great start for me because it really it int really introduced me to the business that I was in, that I found myself in. Um I met a lot of people in the in through the chapter level in the chapter who who had been or were in the process of or would later become very involved internationally with MPI, either serving on committees or actually be being um, what was then called president, now chairman of the board. Um, and, and this chapter, very small chapter, has a great history of producing um, international leaders. And so I just got, again, I got really lucky. I got, I got in the right chapter, uh, at the right time in my career to make a lot of connections and to learn my craft. And then also to have people who were involved in an international level that could help me and, and push me along to get involved at a greater level beyond, beyond the chapter. And the story to me also demonstrates the importance of associations. Absolutely. Um, and the importance of that face to face interaction, which never would have occurred if it had just simply been online. Right. Right. And I mean, your MPI Industry Leader Award is just one of your many awards. I know last year you received a Lifetime Achievement Award from PCMA, and you've also served on PCMA's board and chaired their annual convention. Can you touch upon that? Yeah, I was. Um... Uh, I mean, I've I've actually been quite astonished at the number of awards I've gotten in these last couple of years because I'm like, I'm not quite sure I deserve any of them, um, but um, but I'm taking them. Um, no doubt about that. Um, I started. I actually joined PCMA about five or six months before I joined MPI. So all in that same that first year that I was in the business, I I paid membership dues to four different organizations that I felt would be ones that would help me bring business to Carbondale at the time. And so PCMA was one, um, what is now DI, it was the International Association of Convention Bureaus at the time, and um, um, ASAE, as well as MPI. And so I went to my first PCMA uh, conference Again, not knowing a soul um, about two months after I got in the business. And, and again, I just, on the opening reception, I happened to meet somebody who knew other people and introduced me around. And so um, um, both organizations have been very important to me um, my entire career. And um, they helped make my career. They helped make me who I am. They helped train me for the jobs that I had and to be better at those jobs. So it was um, incredibly important to get that Lifetime Achievement Award last year from PCMA. It was very, very uh, much an honor. That's great. And then you also received Destination International's Leadership in, in Environmentally Responsible Tourism Award. And in 2019, you were in, inducted into their Hall of Fame. Um, can you tell me a little bit of, about that? 
Yeah, the Environmentally Responsible Tourism Award came uh, years and years ago, um, just from uh, some interaction that I had had with trying to uh, train destinations on the importance of embracing and not fighting um, efforts to be more environmentally responsible in in our activities and how we how we managed through meetings and events and also the impact that tourism would have on our destinations. And um, I think I probably got that award from DI 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, maybe even, um, uh, because a lot of people weren't talking about it in those days, or if they were talking about it, it was something that they didn't really want to have to do. Um, and then uh, DI did induct me into their Hall of Fame in 2019, which actually was during the convention that we hosted here. We hosted DI's annual convention here in 2019. So it was great to be able to have that happen um, while I was in, in my own hometown with my own team in the audience. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And since we are talking about awards, there's also the Apex Award from Black Meetings and Tourism. Um, which made me want to ask you, how important is diversity and inclusion when it comes to meetings and conferences? And like, what do you feel the industry gets right and not so right? Um, well, it's it's very important. I mean, it's important socially. So if it's if anything is important socially, it should be important to the meetings and, and events industry. Um, and you know, I would say that, you know, in many respects, we're no different than any other industry um, and the history um, in that we didn't, we were not, as an industry, we were not intentional about trying to be diverse. We were not intentional about trying to bring people into our organization who didn't just step up and volunteer on their own. And um, so we've we are in a recovery period because I mean, just like society and just in general in any other industry, we should have been doing this a long time ago. And um, so I think we need to increase our efforts. And uh, to your question about what we're doing right, I do think now, um, there is a lot of attention that's been placed on it as an industry. Um, and I think that DMOs in particular are really um, engaged in it. Um, and I know that DI has been, and I know there are leaders within, within DI, uh, Destinations International, um, many of the heads of the DMOs in leadership have um, not only embraced it themselves, but have have tried to bring others along. So I do think that we are getting it right because we're putting the right focus on it now, um, but we still have a long way to go. So destination management organizations need to do so much more now than be marketing groups. And I think that really came into the spotlight um, with the Roe versus Wade decision. And I wanted just to get your opinion on how DMOs can help and like, and your opinion on travel boycotts. Well, do we have five hours to talk about this? Because <laughs> that's, that's a very uh, complex subject. Um, it, there, it's not new, first of all. This is not new. When I first got in the business 40 years ago, um, we were talking about the Equal Rights Amendment for women and states that had ratified that or states that had not ratified that. And there were boycotts back then. Um, there were uh, organizations, women's organizations primarily, but others that saw that, that, that saw women's issues as important to them. Um, that made that statement back in those days. Um, and then we saw what happened in Arizona with the Martin Luther King holiday. And, 
um, I mean, this is this has been going on for a long time. Um, I don't think they're particularly effective boycotts. I mean, I don't I don't think they're particularly effective. Um, I don't think they have the desired impact. And I and I and I go back all the way to the ERA, uh, to the Equal Rights Amendment. It didn't change anything. We didn't, as a country, we didn't pass the Equal Rights Amendment anyway. Um, but it did a lot of harm to individual destinations that didn't really have a say in the policy of their states. Um, with that said, I think we, as DMOs, we can make an impact. We can help carry that message, but we don't elect our state legislatures. You know, those of us individually uh, within a within a destination. I'll take St. Louis as an example, as a as a part of Missouri. Um, St. Louis is a very democratically based city, and the surrounding region is as well, until you get to a certain point mm -hmm. um, geographically, and then it and then it flips and it becomes very Republican, and almost all the rest of the state is very Republican until you get to the very far west side of the state where Kansas City is, and then Kansas City again is a bastion of Democrats. So if there are policies that are set by the state legislature, they're almost always going to be policies that follow the Republican platform. And if we have organizations that are holding meetings and, and events, business events that uh, from a national basis um, that are more democratic in their leanings than Republican in their leanings, then they could establish a boycott against the two major cities within the state. And those are the two major cities that probably agree with them on their issue. I see. But can't actually impact what the legislature is doing in the middle of the state, because the majority of the people who are elected to that legislature are from other parts of the state, not not the parts that actually are empathizing. And when you do a boycott on an issue like that to a destination that's very, very meetings oriented, like in the, I'm just using our example, like in the case of St. Louis and Kansas City is a big bread and butter for our industry. The people that actually get hurt when the industry gets hurt are the people that live and tend to vote for people who are actually empathizing with your the organization's position. So I'm not sure if I'm saying it very well, um, except to say that I don't think they work. I haven't seen them actually, except for very, very rare situations actually have any impact um, on the actual legislation and and they can be very harmful to not to the people that they're trying to harm but to the people actually that they would not want to harm if they if they thought thought through what's what's being done and then I would say that the the few times that I've seen the impact actually work, it's because of sports, <laughs> not because of meetings and conferences. It's because the sports guys can talk sports to the legislators who don't value meetings and business events, but do really understand that the NCAA Final Four, they don't want that to boycott their state. Um, so that, that goes to another, that to a whole other area of the importance of our industry and our ability or our inability to tell the same kind of story. But th those are really the only times I can think of when a boycott has actually been successfully, um, done be and it was because the sports people said they were going to boycott, not because the meetings and events people said they were going to boycott. So do you feel the industry still has a ways to go? in letting legislators realize the importance and the economic impact it represents? 
Yeah. And, it, the, you know, and the challenge for us as DMOs is, you know, my legislators in St. Louis, they get it. Mm-hmm. They they totally get it. They're very supportive of our industry and they know what it means for our community. They know what it means for the businesses in our community and the workers in our community. But the majority of our state legislators are people who are from areas that aren't really meetings and events uh, driven Mm -hmm. and maybe not even tourism driven, maybe not even have any tourism to speak of, you know, if they are, if they are very simply rural communities, their focus is on agriculture. Okay. Not, not on tourism. And so it will always be very challenging for us to deal with state legislatures unless we are in unless we have a state whose entire economy and so and many many destinations within it has really got a, a strong piece of their economy that comes from tourism it, without that it's going to continually be a struggle so if there is a meeting group who is interested in bringing a piece of business to St. Louis but it doesn't really have the same politics as the state, but feels St. Louis has all the components in place that it needs to have a successful event. Do you have any suggestions as to what planners can do? Like maybe, you know, go visit with a legislator to explain the economic impact of that event and talk about issues. Is that something that you could help facilitate? Yes. Um, although I would say that most organizations don't really want to have to mess with that. They, mm-hmm. It's just easier for them to go to another state so and find a lose that business within that state. Yeah. I mean, what I would say is don't, don't, don't boycott a city like St. Louis or Kansas city because you don't agree with what Missouri as a state is doing. Come to us or Kansas city or Go to Chicago if it, it well, Chicago and Illinois are, are both the Democratic, so that's not a good one. But when there's a conflict, because it can be it can be the opposite. You could you could be a Republican leaning organization like the NRA or you know, something like that, and you don't want to go to a you don't want to go to a state that is got has got anti-gun laws, right? So it can, it can be one or the other. Doesn't I'm not saying it's all, but but in our case, don't penalize us a democratically based city if you are a democratically based organization in your ideals work with us come to us and say to us will will we get support from your mayor will we get support from your county executive what can we do to make sure this is a positive thing for st louis and then you know maybe the folks in the rest of the state of missouri will understand that the impact, the positive impact that has been made by having this, but by by taking us out of the picture, um, you're never going to make your case anyway, and you're actually going to you're going to hurt the people in the hospitality industry who are very dependent on us being successful. Okay. Um, you touched upon um, women's rights, and um, the reality is you're one of the only women in the country running, well, you are the only woman in the country running operations for three entities. That's the Explore St. Louis. Um, You're responsible for sales and marketing of the city in that role. And you're also run the convention center and the dome at America's center. Um, I'm curious as to how you feel about the fact there's not many women heading DMOs like you are and what it's like to run, you know, three operations like you are in St. Well, there are, there are many more women running DMOs now than than there used to be. So it's a it's a progression, um, and and there are many more women who are running large DMOs, um, which is uh, I mean is a real testament to where we've come from. I remember in my uh, early days in the industry, um, there were no women 
running large DMOs um, until Charlotte St. Martin was hired and she came from the hotel world um, in a very high position and, and until she came into the industry to head the DMO there in Dallas. Um, that was groundbreaking for a large DMO to have a woman uh, at their head. And um, there were, I was, I was always a woman and I was always the head of the DMO or I mean, in a lot of my jobs, not always, but, um, but it was small, it was small cities. It was, you know, when I started in Carbondale, I was a one person shop. So um, it was a lot of small DMOs, one, two, three person uh, organizations, but the big ones, the the big cities, those decisions were being made by the boards of those DMOs and the boards were all made up of basically male hoteliers. Um, so they, you know, they had their own network and, um, and so women weren't able to break through. And so, you know, we've seen that changing now. We've got a lot more women running these organizations and that, and I, I think that will continue um, because we've been able to get women up in the ranks uh, we also are getting women in at the board levels that make those decisions. Um, uh, we've got a long we've got a long way to go still, but but we've really come come a long way. And I would say the same thing about convention centers. There were very few. I mean, Peggy Didakis ran the Baltimore Convention Center for forty years, thirty thirty years at least, maybe forty. Um, she was one of the first women to do that and um and and you know that that certainly has changed over time um but it is still it is still a male dominated um job and it's harder for women because so so many of those jobs come up from the operations side mm -hmm. and so if if a woman doesn't start in on the operations side if she's if she doesn't start in you know and uh uh being in housekeeping or in uh as an electrician or or something where they kind of work their way up that way um it's it's kind of hard women tend to go more towards the event management side and um and those top jobs tend to go more towards people who have the operations background and understand how hvac systems work etc and so that still still tends to be more male Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. Can you offer advice to women who would like to break the, the glass ceiling in the industry? Yeah, I, well, I think first of all, just put yourself out there um, and work hard and, and do a good job, but don't, don't just assume that somebody's going to notice you. Just because you work hard and do a good job doesn't mean somebody's going to notice you. So put yourself out there and, and develop your networks um, because I get calls all the time. Um, and so I'm sure everybody else does, but I get calls all the time from people saying, we have an open job. Do you know of anybody? Can you refer anyone? And so if you haven't put yourself out there and I don't know you, even though you're working really hard and doing a great job in your convention center or your DMO, I, I don't I don't know you to refer somebody to you. So that's what I'm saying. Put yourself out there. Get yourself involved in the industry organizations so that people know who you are. Uh, in addition to working hard and doing a good job. So it circles back to what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation, networking and being part of associations. Yeah, it really does. Um, and it's, you know, if the if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that uh, our our networking and our face-to-face -face interactions cannot be replaced. 
How is St. Louis doing post-pandemic? I read a study that you're still not back to where you were before the pandemic. Yeah, we're not quite there. Our, like, you know, we use so many different metrics, um, uh, you know, airline employments for our airport um, are strong. They're very strong. They're still not quite there. And we, uh, you know, I, I don't think the planes could be any more full on the weekends. It's business travel that is lagging. We're doing well in meetings and conventions. We're doing well in special events. Uh, we're doing really well in terms of leisure business overall. But, um, you know, until the companies start putting people back out on the roads for just general business travel and Tuesday and Wednesday become peak peak days for airline travel and also, as a result, peak days for hotel stays, um, we're not going to see we're not going to see a complete return. Now, when we look at some metrics, it actually looks like we have met or exceeded 2019. And a, an example of that is our hotel revenue. And the hotel revenue has actually exceeded where we were when the pandemic hit. But that's simply because the rates are all higher, not because the occupancy is higher. And so, again, that really goes back to business travel. What used to be the peak nights being Tuesday, Wednesday, because of all the business travel that was was the base and then meetings and conferences were layered in on top of that. Now it's meetings and conferences pretty much only on Tuesday and Wednesday. And um, there's business travel that has returned, certainly, um, and continues to return, but it's it's not anywhere near where it was, at least in most destinations. And how has your city been impacted by remote work? Yeah, it's really it's really just starting to have that impact. You know, St. Louis was uh, was being touted as late as the start of this calendar year as being better off than most cities in the country um, in terms of that impact. And and now suddenly um, that has that has turned and um, we've had a, a number of uh, companies just decide to uh, relinquish their space or a lot of their space as their leases are coming up and um, making the decision that they're not going to not going to be back at the same level they were pre pandemic. And so as a city, you know, how do you I mean, we, you know, as a destination marketing organization, we can't bring new businesses here. That's not our, that's mm -hmm. not our role. Um, you know, there are economic development agencies that are supposed to be doing that. And so we will uh, let them try. Um, but, uh, you know, what our role then is to uh, try to educate our local legislators um, on the importance of making sure that the visitor experience is a really good one, is a better one and continues to be a better one and develop that so that we can um, attract more people who are here for leisure purposes. And like my, you know, my argument to our elected leaders here in St. Louis is if you make the St. Louis experience great for attendees, for meetings and conferences, and those that are coming here for leisure travel, to see the arch, to go to a Cardinals baseball game, to whatever, if you make that experience really good for them here, it's also then the kind of experience that people will want to work in and maybe will be effective in helping to stave off companies deciding to let people stay home because maybe their people will actually want to be downtown in the hub of the activity where things are going on. So we'll see how that goes. What is new in the city for groups? Uh, we've actually had a lot of new venues just open this year, which is great. Um, many of them were started um, in development pre pandemic and didn't really take a, didn't take a hiatus. They continued to move forward in terms of the development through the pandemic. So that meant that in 2022, um, we actually 
started to see a lot of new openings. We've got uh, a venue called City Foundry, another one called The Armory, um, both in the city, um, both big venues that are really great for groups to be able to do off-premise venues. Um, and then other kind of existing attractions that were here that have developed new things for people to just do on their own, um, uh, new experiences, new uh, ball, ballpark village is an example, which is, which is a, an entertainment development that surrounds Bush stadium where the Cardinals play downtown that has continued to add new elements. So we have new hotel there. Uh, Lo there's a live by Lowe's that's there. Um, there are a ton of new restaurants there, things for people to do. Um, and some of our existing visitor attractions have added more things like city museum, which is a, just like an adult playground downtown. Um, it's not a museum at all. Um, has added new elements and things for people to do. So there's just there's just a whole lot more activity for both groups as as a group function for off premise events and also for attendees for meetings and conferences to do on their own in the city in the in the in the downtown area. Yeah, that sounds great. And I'm getting um, back to you for a minute. You started as a retail store manager early in your career. Um, I was curious in finding out how you found your way to the meetings at industry. Ah, well, I was in uh, I was in retail for well, I started working retail when I was in high school, and um, you know I was planning on going to college. I was actually accepted by a couple of women's colleges actually, um, and then I had a fight with my dad one day. <laughs> and uh, he said something like, if you're going to live under my house, you're going to follow my rules. And I said, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I went to the place that I was working and I said, no, yeah, I would like to work here full time. And they said, OK. And they made me an assistant store manager. And then pretty soon they gave me my own store and. Uh -huh. Pretty soon I had a couple of stores and I was a regional. And so I was doing that all. I was like 20, wow. 21, 22. I was, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, and then after about five or six years, I just, one day I called my dad and I said, you were right. I was wrong. I should have gone to college. I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, don't do anything rash. And I said, I'm not just let you know, <laughs> um, blowing off some steam. And a few weeks later, he called me and he said Carbondale was advertising for a director for their tourism bureau that they were starting. And I said, what's a tourism bureau? And there you have it. Wow. I got the job because he said to me, he said, do you think anybody who knows anything about tourism is going to move to Carbondale to do it? <laughs> you are so right. Nobody. So. I just went to the library and did all kinds of research on meetings, events, and leisure tourism. And then I went in and bluffed my way through an interview and got the job. Wow, that's amazing. And it takes a big person to call and say, you were right, I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, he practically dropped the phone because I don't think in my, you know, at that point, 19 or 20 years or however old I was, I don't know, 20, 21. I don't think I, he'd probably ever heard me say I was wrong. <laughs> oh my gosh. What is the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Um, well, anybody who knows me close to me knows this, so they wouldn't be surprised at all. But um, I am a 40 plus year vegetarian, which yeah. most people probably, you know, when I be when I became vegetarian in the early 80s, I don't, you know, people thought I was really weird. <laughs> it was weird. Uh, my brother used to say to me, like, Krishna, Krishna, Hari Krishna, as if I was, you know, some kind of person from an outer, you know, planet instead of the Irish Catholic, you know, kid he knew. Um, but uh, so, you know, I've been not killing animals for 40 years. So there you look go. and look at it. now it's one of the biggest food trends, isn't it? I know. But it was hard back then. In those days, their restaurants had no vegetarian options. 
but None. they would give you iceberg lettuce, right? <laughs> oh yeah, it was awful, awful <laughs> stuff. And I would, which iceberg lettuce has no nutritional value. So nobody should ever eat it. You should <laughs> always eat spinach or something that actually has good nutritional value. But and anyway. If you're from the Iceberg Lettuce Foundation, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that Iceberg Lettuce Foundation, but it really, it's, you know, it's a, it's a nice ad, but it doesn't have any nutritional value other than the fact that it's got a lot of water in it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I used to call, I mean, being in, when I got in the business, and you know, being in the business, every single banquet that I went to, I would call the hotel in advance and ask for the banquets department and tell them that I was going to be attending the, you know, Rotary Club lunch or whatever it was, and um, that I needed a vegetarian meal. I mean, that's what that's what you had to do in those days. That wasn't meeting professionals did not order vegetarian meals. They didn't order vegetarian alternatives for somebody who said they wanted one. So if you went to a banquet, the first time anybody heard that you wanted a vegetarian meal was when you said it to your server. So they weren't prepared. So I always called them in advance and and ordered it. And so one day I didn't have to do that anymore because everybody got with the program it was so great. And I didn't have to eat just cheese. <laughs> what what made you become vegetarian back then? Um, uh, I read or no, it was it was animal. Related. I read an article about how calves were treated to make right. milk fed right. veal. And went off veal, and then it was just one thing after another. Well, I'm a vegetarian as well, so there you I know. get it. <laughs> good. Very good for you. Saved some animals in your lifetime. <laughs> um, what attributes or qualities have you developed that ha have led to your success? Um, well, I don't know if I've developed besides them, being a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, well, that doesn't that ha that has not led to my success. <laughs> In fact, that's probably held me back a few times because some people just thought I was weird. Um, <laughs> men, basically. Sorry, I know there may be a man or two listening to the podcast, but, you know. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up in a, I grew up in a household where you were expected to work and you worked mm -hmm. hard and, you know, my parent, my dad came from nothing, mm -hmm. uh, really nothing. I mean, he's, his dad died when he was three years old and he slept on a cot in a one bedroom kitchen and his or one bed. He slept on a cot in the kitchen in a one bedroom apartment and his mother and sister slept in the one bed in the one bedroom. And so where was that? In Chicago. Wow. Um, and so he came from nothing and he wanted good things for us. And he always provided good things for us, but we never had a lot of money. And so we were always expected to work and we have, so I, I think I've always had a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and I expect that from others too. Okay. Um, so I expect to see that and I have great respect for people, uh, in my organization and others that I work with that I see have a good work ethic. And I, don't necessarily have respect for people who I think are coasting half the time mm -hmm. um, because it's hard. Life is hard. Life right. is hard and our industry is hard. And um, while it's often, you know, oftentimes we say we have fun jobs because we get to do fun things and we really do get to do fun things. We also have a great responsibility mm -hmm. to our communities. The people that hire us, hire us to do good work. and. Um, that means we are beholden to the, to the ideals of the community, to the, uh, economy of the community. And in particular for me, the importance is to the people who work in the industry and it's our responsibility to do the very best job that we can to ensure that people have jobs and have good jobs and have things they can count on, um, which was, which is why the pandemic was so very devastating for us because we were in so many ways so powerless because um, governments were making decisions. And I mean, I was fighting those governments here every day um, about restrictions on us. And I am a strong believer in being vaccinated. And I was, you know, I volunteered to give the 
convention center free for vaccinations so that our own team could get vaccinated. I mean, it was very, I'm very, very strong on that personally. Um, but I also felt that the restrictions that were being imposed on us were arbitrary and that people were making decisions about sizes of gatherings and sizes of venues when they had no knowledge of what the the ability of those venues were to create a safe environment. And um, so, you know, that time was so challenging because we knew we had so many people dependent on us and looking to us to help them. Um, and, it and it was hard to help them. So. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier, like a lack of understanding. Right, right. So it's, a, you know, as a DMO, it's a constant education for us. Um, for me personally, it's my whole career has been based on this. And, you know, I know that when we can reward people for doing a good job, recognize them for doing a good job, um, in our industry, that means the world. Because quite often, those folks are kind of behind the scenes and no one ever thanks them, you know. Okay. Um, but if But if no one ever thanks them, what's, you know. Why do they, why would they want to stay in this industry? Mm -hmm. How many are on your team? We're not, we're still not quite back to pre-pandemic levels, but we have uh, right now about 115 full-time. Okay. Um, and then hundreds and hundreds of part-times and then also contract workers on the, on the convention center and the stadium side, you know, we've got vendors that provide, you know, other jobs, but those aren't on our, our, mm -hmm. our team directly. Well, that is a large team that you're leading. How, how do you make sure you're an effective leader? Do you have any tips you can share? Mm -hmm. It's hard to know whether you're being effective or not, isn't it? Um, it, it is hard as a leader because you have to have, I think you have to have some ability to read people yourself because you can't just rely on what you're being told um, by, I mean, you have to have confidence in the direct reports. You have to hire people, good people that you trust who report to you directly. But you also can't rely just on what you're being told because there is an untold story everywhere. And the untold story might not be positive. Um, the untold story might be very positive, but no one thinks to share it. So I do think as a leader, you have to walk around a little bit. Uh, I try to do that in the convention center because I tend to spend mo more of my time in my office. Um, than an effective leader should. So I try to get down and walk around the convention center and say hello to people and and just ask them how they're doing and stop and talk to, you know, George, the part-time worker who, you know, has to have call a ride because he's disabled, but he's still here and I want to know how he's doing. And if I talk to him, I might hear some things from him that I wouldn't hear from any of my direct reports. Because he sees things differently and, and he sees things that others maybe don't see at all. So I think an effective leader has to be able to do that. Uncover the untold story. Yeah, positive or negative. Okay. What does the future hold for the industry? Um, I think it's I think it's very bright. Um, you know, I, I said it just a minute ago in a in a kind of a different context, but about the pandemic, there were all kinds of people who are not in our industry who gave a prognosis for our industry that was very negative. And we heard it nationally and internationally and locally, people who said, well, there won't be convention. There's no need for convention centers in the future. Well, the meetings in industry has changed forever and everything is going to be done online. And you, you couldn't argue with those people. I mean, I argued with those people when <laughs> I had the opportunity. I'm good at that. Um, but I will take them on. 
and tell them they're wrong, but you couldn't really argue with them because everything was an unknown at that point, right? What they saw was everything was shut down. And until things were able to restart and you could see and you could demonstrate to them that they had been wrong, you couldn't you couldn't convince them at the time that they were wrong. And so I think what has happened is that we know that they were wrong and they know that they were wrong. Um, and that while th some things have changed and that's a constant, things always change. Um, our industry has sh been shown to be critically important mm -hmm. because that face-to-face -face interaction is not something that can be replaced online. It simply isn't. There are lots of other tools that can help facilitate dialogue, can help facilitate education, um, but there is nothing like the face-to-face -face that goes on. We have a convention going on right here, right in in-house right now, it started yesterday. It's a union convention, national convention. Um, they're doing their voting for their officers. They could do their voting online, but what's happening here is that they're electioneering, right? They're standing in the lobbies of the convention center downstairs right below me, and they're wearing the shirts for their candidates, and they're passing out buttons, and they are influencing votes because they can do that face-to-face -face in a way they could never do it online. And there are just some things that um, we've, you know, we've been we've been proven out as an industry. If anybody thought our industry was dying, they found out they were wrong. And I think it's, you know, it's just very bright going forward. Our last question is always, who should we have on the next podcast? Who would you recommend we reach out to? Um, I don't know if you've done this with him. I didn't see it on your list, but I would recommend that you talk to Mike Gamble um, with SearchWide because he's really doing a lot of work on recruitment in the industry. Um, you asked me one question earlier about you know diversity. Um, that's something that he's taken on in terms of a focus um, and just the future of workforce and changes in workforce. I think he'd be a really good one. Um, and I don't know if you've spoken with uh, Sheriff Karamat at PCMA, or Michelle Mason at ASAE, but um, Michelle's been doing really great work, I think, at ASAE, and and it's been a, um, I think it's it's been hard. I would I would guess it's been hard. John Graham did just such a phenomenal job with ASAE for so long, and then with his illness and then the pandemic, I think I think they were in a bit of hurt, and I think she's doing a really great job. And Sheriff is doing amazing work now with uh, artificial intelligence and all kinds of other tools at PCMA. Right. So. Well, this has been great. No. So, yeah, <laughs> fascinating. Kitty, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. How long have you been with Skift? Because you were not. <laughs> I, I've been with them for a year and a half. A year and a half. Okay. That's yes. what I because I saw your name come up with Skift and I thought, wait a minute, I thought she was with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> but no, happy to be with Skift and so happy to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun for me too. Will thank you, you very at, much. Will you be at DI next week? Uh, just for the very first day. I have to leave Wednesday morning. Um, so um, uh, maybe get, we I can get, meet. I'll be there. Oh, okay. I'll yeah. get in. I get in Monday night and leave Wednesday morning. Okay. I'll reach out. Via Terrific. email. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye.